Okay. Far too often we think about princesses as these powerless children of royalty who all they are into is pink and glitter. But in reality, they have been the ones not only in Disney universe, but also in our own world who are movers and shakers. And in that, I am excited that you have joined us today for Women's Her Story, which is a program celebrating women's for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I recognize that we will have quite a few more people joining us as we continue through today's listening and, and panel, virtual panel discussion, I'll put it that way. Um, we have some fabulous women who are here who will be sharing with us their stories. And without further ado, I'm gonna actually go ahead and get started because I know that they have so much to share. Um, and we want to be sure that we have enough time to do that as well as if you all have any questions of them as well. So first of all, I'll start by saying there's power in allowing yourself to be known and heard, in owning your unique story, in using your authentic voice by our forever first lady, Michelle Obama. If you notice the words that we have in bold, the power to be known and heard, our unique stories and our authentic voices. This is what we will share from today and recognizing that no woman in their story is the same. And so, yes, we have a, a large group of women um, and we look forward to learning from their unique stories in their own authentic voice. First of all, we have DeAndre Hardy. As a proud first generation college student, DeAndre Hardy is passionate about increasing success outcomes for first generation college students and diverse student populations. She currently serves as the director for student retention in the Title III grant. Her diverse experiences in higher education include TRIO programs, academic advising, transfer articulation, and working in professional higher education consulting. Anne Hurd, a Greensboro College alumni, alumna, excuse me, of 1981. After graduation from GC, Anne put her English degree to work as a writer for newspapers and magazines, then transitioned into marketing and communications director roles for several nonprofit organizations. She earned her master's from UNC Greensboro in communication. She's a certified fundraising executive and has had five successful capital campaigns, raising millions of dollars, including in her current role as vice president of advancement and admissions. Marley Jarvis. Marley is in her second season as the assistant women's soccer coach for the Pride. She spent four years playing at St. Bonaventure and five years as a member of the St. Antiguan Women's National Team and has appeared in CONCACAF Caribbean qualifiers for the Antiguan Women's National Team. While coaching, she is still working on her master's in strategic leadership from St. Bonaventure. Jean Lico. Jean who is a Jefferson Pilot Professor of Physical Education, has been a member of the faculty and the staff at GC for over 40 years. Jean is a member of five Hall of Fames and served on numerous NCAA and AVCA committees. She also serves as the College Marshal and on the Faculty Affairs Committee. Heather Macy, a GC graduate of the year 2000. Heather finished her first season as the head women's basketball coach here at Greensboro College. She played four years for the Pride from 1996 to 2000, where she posted one of the top five best three-point shooting marks in, in school history. 
Macy spent six years as the head coach at East Carolina University from 2012 to 2018 and has also been head coach at Francis Marion in Pfeiffer. Dr. Sheila Nayar. She's a professor of English communication and media studies. She's the author of five books and numerous book chapters and essays that span orality and literary studies, medieval and Renaissance studies, film studies, religious studies, technology studies, and more. Dr. Michelle Plaisance. Michelle Plaisance earned her doctorate in urban education at UNC and has been with Greensboro College since 2014. In addition to directing the graduate programs in teaching English speakers of other languages, she maintains a research agenda related to curricular equity for non-native English speakers in K through 12 settings and student engagement in online learning contexts. And my name is Tasha Marie Myers, and I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Greensboro College. So today I will be serving as the moderator asking questions of our panel. And if you have additional questions that you would like to add, I ask that you would add those either in the chat to the um, in an entire audience or to me directly. So our first question, goes out to any of our, our panelists. What does it mean to you to be a woman? And do you think that differs from society's expectations of gender roles? Tasha, I'm on with you. Hey, I'm making sure I'm off of mute there. Thank you so much for the question. Um, and thank you so much uh, for hosting this. Really appreciate being a part in, um, uh, in the sport arena. I've got a very uh, unique role as a female. First off, this is a very male dominated industry. I just finished uh, my 20th year and I am proud to say that I have been at every level of intercollegiate athletics. So I have been a head division one coach um, all the way to a head junior college coach. So I think I have a wide variety of experiences uh, where I can kind of cross compare uh, some of these things. But the biggest thing for me in the coaching arena is I want to mirror what a strong female leader looks like specifically to our athletes and how a female leader conducts herself and handles herself and how how to do that has changed dramatically during my 20 years at first you know it felt like you've got to be one of the guys to fit in and so as you become uh, more comfortable in your own skin and more confident in your competency in the athletic field specifically for me within coaching i've learned that the key is to be who you are uh, and be yourself so that those kids can understand that to stand in your truth and to be able to say, um, I'm good enough and uh, I'm excited to be the leader and excited to be the person that you can look to through adversity, uh, that to be able to exhibit strength is the key for me. Thank you. Do you have any other panelists that would like to tag in on this question? Go ahead, Ann. Sure. Um, I'm Ann Hurd, and thank you for hosting this. This is a great idea. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, for me, being, being a woman, I, I love being a woman. I never wanted to be, you know, anything else. <laughs> um, and when, and I should say, I'm probably the oldest one on the panel. So when I started out professionally in the early 80s, there were jobs that were not open to me, jobs that I was declined. Um, I was declined because, in, in fact, my first job, I applied to be um, on the police beat of the High Point Enterprise, the newspaper. And they told me that they didn't think that a woman should be on the police beat. And I said that was ridiculous. They did not give me the job. 
but um, I went on to, to other, other jobs and proved myself. But when I got into development, um, especially with major gifts, it was a male dominated profession. Um, they, there were plenty of women. They, they let us do annual fund and, and alumni relations and that kind of thing. But um, I sort of had to, to elbow my way into major gifts because you have to be able to go in at the time and, and um, you know, talk to businessmen who sort of controlled the resources and the money and, you know, ask them to invest in, in you know, in education. And that's, that's where my passion has always been is raising money for education. And, and if I could just say, um, I am a third generation college graduate, women in my family. My grandmother was a college graduate. My mother was a college graduate and I am as well. And that's very unusual. And that's because my great grandfather was a farmer. They didn't have any money. He took a job at, um, at a prison like 25 miles away and drove his farm truck so that he could raise, he could earn the money to send his daughter, my grandmother, to the teacher's college. Um, at, it was ECU, it was actually where Heather was in the 30s. And then my mother was a Methodist minister's daughter. Um, so she got to come to Greensboro College tuition free, but she had to wait tables. So she waited on her, she worked in the cafeteria in the dining room and waited on her classmates. And so that's why, um, and, and I, I was, um, I was an administrator's daughter, so my tuition was free. That is why I have worked my entire career to make education accessible for people like in my family who didn't have the resources to go to college. None of us did, but education was so important, and, um, and that's what I'm passionate about. Tasha, I'd like to speak up. Um... Uh, and Ann knows that I'm older than her, so I don't know why she said that. <laughs> By one year. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's interesting uh, that that whole question, when you say, um, you know, what does it mean to be a woman? I, you know, that that's just such an interesting question to me. I I grew up in a sports family, so sports has been my whole life. I was called a tomboy when I was young, you know, uh, that's that whole gender thing, uh, you know, associated with it. I played four sports in high school and three in college and I, I my whole life was sports. And, um, I, I know that my characteristics, um, of what I think of myself, I, I know that I'm a very strong, strong willed person. I'm very self-confident, um, you know, I'm very opinionated, <laughs> and but I'm also very self-sufficient, and I don't think that that matches up to what uh, culture considers a feminine woman, so, um, so I, don't, I think I've always kind of been outside the box in that sense. Um, I would just like to add that for me, and I thank you for all the stories and the comments already made, because it just, I love hearing about how people have overcome um, different obstacles in their lives, and um, it just shows the progress as women, how far we've come as women in society. Um, but for me, I would say that being a woman is really about standing in your, owning your voice, and standing in that voice and in your confidence. Um, about what makes you you. And so as a first generation college student, um, as a black woman um, growing up on a military base, I've always been very competitive. I've always been very vocal. Um, my mother at, joked when I said I was changing my major from business to communication studies because she was like, you don't have any problem communicating. So you should probably um, be teaching there. So it was just her little joke about that I talk a lot and that I am very opinionated. And I've learned to own that um, coming into my own as a professional um, because, you know, there are so many people who want your voice silent and you have just so much to offer. And so um, I've come to own having a strong opinion, having standing in my voice and not 
being scared. I think earlier in my career and definitely younger, I would have some nervousness or get the feedback about being too much. Um, but now I own that I'm not too much. I'm enough and I'm here and I'm taking up the space to make a positive change. And so that's what I hope that I um, emulate to others in my leadership. Thank you. Our next question, what does the term her story mean to you? So I, um, Sheila and I are here. Um, I guess because I am an academic and I think like an academic, um, the term for me really is about recouping um, a long history where women's voices have been oppressed, ignored, uh, dismissed. Um, and so I think of it partly as a, as a historical job that we need to do to um, bring those voices back that history um, sort of erased. Um, so I don't think of it so much in terms of my own personal being as a female, but as a, as a long-term project that we have to undertake um, in the arts and the humanities, in history, et cetera, to um, bring those voices back into some degree that has been being done, for instance, in the literature programs where women's, women's novels have been um, slowly being brought back uh, um, and, um, and certainly in film too, there are a lot of n women directors now who are arising and, and telling stories of the past um, as a kind of way to recoup history that has been um, erased. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else have something to add to that one? Okay, our next question. What are some of the accomplishments that make you a history maker? Okay. Hi, Michelle Plaisance. Thank you so much for having me here today, Tasha. This is a great forum and a wonderful opportunity to share. Um, and ironically, I'm not really comfortable saying that I'm a history maker of any kind, but I'd like to think that I've contributed to the view of women in today's society as being capable and active contributors um, and primarily to a greater good. And I've not ever considered my accomplishments to be something that I've done while overcoming societal views of women. Um, rather, I've embraced these the, the social constructs you know, that surround femininity um, and um, you know, I think that some of my most important accomplishments have resulted from those traits that are considered, you know, primarily female in nature and, and by in some circles, maybe weak characteristics such as being nurturing or cooperative, diplomatic, um, verbal, humble, having empathy. Um, when I think about my work, I, I think that these are the things that have made me the most successful when so often they're considered by others in our society as being um, you know, the lesser qualities that we need to bring to the workforce. Thank you. That's a great point. <clears throat> Hard to follow that, but I would say my longevity. <laughs> <laughs> So say more about that. Why, why longevity? Well, um, I, when, you, when I think a history maker, I mean, yeah, I've certainly received awards and rewards. And, um, but having been in one place for such a long time allows you to create and um, uh, gives you so many more opportunities. Um, you know, I, I've always found ways to do what I want to do at Greensboro College because I've been there so long. I, I know the ins and outs and how to get around and, and those type of things. But I think longevity gives me opportunities to, um, I, I know students from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and, you know, 40 years is a long time at one place. So, um, uh, so I think it's just created opportunities to get to know so many of our students, our faculty, staff along the way that, so. Okay. 
one of the things that I think is interesting about this particular question, um, and I debated whether or not it should be accomplishments that make you a history maker versus a history maker. But I invited the women that I invited because I consider them all to be history makers. And I happen to know based off of the bios, which I had to ask several of them several times to shorten because of all of the great um, accomplishments that they have to offer. I find it interesting that they're shying away from this question. Um, and so I'll, I'll put that out there to our panelists of, of why. Oh, well, I will jump in. Um, and I am one of the people you've just had to email several times. So I own that publicly, Tasha. Um, but for me, I know the history is in being a first gen because of being the first person in my immediate family to graduate from college um, and get a master's degree. Um, although education was valued in my family, you know, my grandmother was the daughter of a farmer and her mother passed early um, and her mother was an uh, in-home worker. So she just didn't have the opportunity, but she loved research. And so she's just in her own time, always been this researcher and always been someone who amplified history and education and politics and was just her own, just like strong woman. So when I think about being a history maker, I actually think, in a, think about her first before myself. So, um, but also for me, I, there's so many women on here that I look up to their accomplishments. So especially um, Dr. Nayar and um, Michelle, Dr. Michelle Plaisant, um, looking up to their accomplishments is like, wow, you know, that is something that I could aspire to do and seeing them still be so humble in their roles here. And so I hesitated because I'm like, oh, there's these other like women on here like that are, you know, her story, hashtag her story goals, like let me let them on mute. Um, and so that's why I <laughs> hesitated on here, but I do recognize that there's some generational shifts um, because that I am a major part of in my family. And if, if I could just add one thing, thank you, Deandra. That was a very nice compliment. However, um, you know, I, I don't agree with you uh, because I think we all contribute in, in our own unique and extremely powerful ways. But I think that it does come back to the, your use of the word humble. And so approaching this question from a different perspective, I think that maybe we as a group did not collectively jump on this question because we have been conditioned through our own experiences as women to um, avoid being powerful and avoid, um, you know, tooting our own horns, so to speak. Um, you know, women who do that are typically perceived as being, you know, powerful, cruel, brash. Uh, you know, I could come up with a hundred other adjectives. And I immediately think of Hillary Clinton, who was just torn up in the media, um, you know, for being so accomplished in many of the things that she did. Um, and so I think that that may be the reason that we collectively as a panel didn't jump on this question is because it, it, it's uncomfortable for us um, to speak publicly about what it is that we've accomplished. At least I know this for me personally. I don't want to speak for everybody else. Oh, Michelle, I think we're all on that same train of thought. And, and I'm sitting here 20 years in the industry uh, in college athletics feels like a milestone until you hear Coach Loiko talk about 40 years in it. And so in our industry, which is very uh, fast paced, uh, fast moving, you want to stay ahead of the curve, you want to continue to grow, you want to continue to evolve, because if you don't, your longevity um, will not be there. And so as, as Coach Loiko was talking, Coach, right away, I went right into it. I wrote down the term grit as she talked about her longevity. And, and Coach, you were one of the people as I was a student at Greensboro College and, and you were a professor of mine, as well as my tennis coach, you were someone that I looked up to and said, wow, do you think I could do what she's doing? Because what you did and what you continue to do uh, and what many, many women who are on that same track that we're on uh, to work in intercollegiate athletics and on a college campus, it's not an easy road. It's a tough road. It's a wonderful road. And I, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. But I think it's very difficult for me to see myself um, making history or a history maker 
mostly because it's head down and keep going. And so I think that's where I am with it. And maybe at the very, very end, I'll take a quick break uh, and be able to look back and be reflective. And, and I think that's probably a weakness of mine and, and not enjoying the, the small victory. We haven't given our permission to do so much so that one of the traits that I instill with our basketball team is we celebrate all small victories. And so we win a road game and we're going to stop and get ice cream because I want to break some of those habits that I think for myself aren't great habits uh, to be able to enjoy the small victories. If you're only celebrating the really, really, really big stuff, you may not celebrate that often. So anyone else who's listening, I want to give you guys permission to go get ice cream too and celebrate all of the small stuff. And I, I do think I, I want to bring attention to the note that DeAndre added to the, the chat and recognizing that so often there are um, challenges that prevent you from having the time to do that. I know that there are several of our panelists who are wives and who are mothers, and I intentionally left that out of their their bios. And that's not to say, and as a mother myself, that's not to say that that's not a huge part of my identity. And on most days is actually probably the biggest part. Um, but I can be a woman on my own instead and on my own two feet without the, the connection in the relationships that are a part of that. And I do think it is interesting that, like others have said, we're socialized to think of ourselves as, for me, Mrs. Robert A. Myers, right? Like, no, I am Tasha Myers on my own, right? I'm not the, the parent of, of my kids. Um, and I, I'm so much more than that. And if I don't take the time to celebrate that, I can recognize that I can almost get lost in that. Um, and so for a moment, I would like to actually put our youngest panelist on the spot, um, Marley Jarvis, who I know is someone um, who has international accomplishments um, to, to share some of your own accomplishments and, and what makes you a history maker. Um, kind of just going off of that, I think a lot, a lot of people have already said, but I, I don't Marla, can you speak up just a little bit? We're having a hard time hearing you. Is that good? It's better. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I by no means think of myself um, as a her story or history maker. Um, with my international experience, I, I absolutely, that's kind of the reason why I, I don't believe that. Um, I had the opportunity when I was 17 to go um, play on the uh, Antigua Women's National Team, um, which gave me a really, really amazing experience, but also exposed me to a lot of women um, who, uh, who realistically are her story makers. Um, a lot of people don't know of Antigua. Um, it is a small island in the Caribbean. Um, and it uh, unfortunately uh, does not gain the or garner the resources that um, a lot of the U.S. teams do. Um, so um, one might see the uh, U.S. women's national team and think that's what the national team is for countries all over the world, and that's just not realistic. Um, obviously, in the U.S., we look at the U.S. women's national team. We look at the men's um, national team and we see two completely different treatments, um, which uh, unfortunately you, you can say the same for a lot of the national teams from around the world. Um, so when I was able to go down and play, I was able to see um, the difference, really an experience between myself growing up um, in the US and the experience I had um, in terms of uh, resources, coaches, um, things like that, and then going to Antigua and realizing that, you know, there's, there, there are mothers on that team um, who have to take time off from their, their full-time jobs um, for, you know, months on end and not get compensated for it. Um, so it, 
it definitely when uh, kind of jumping ahead to one of our other questions but those are the people that i you know i admire and look up to that are able to um to to deal with all of these different things um and me being 17 on my first time i was just thinking oh i'm just here to play soccer and for a lot of them it was you know this is my livelihood um this is you know not necessarily an extracurricular or something to have, just have fun like i'm representing my country um, I'm doing this for my children so that they're able to see their mom um, doing something for a country. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question, but I do not consider myself. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully, um, not, in the future, not now. <laughs> can I piggyback off of that, what Marley was offering? Um, I really tend to agree with, with her. Um, and first of all, I love that this is not just, you know, athletics or administration or faculty that it's all of us together which is wonderful um, but I'm half Indian and my dad is from India and I lived several years in India um, and his was the story of poverty and and lack of um, privilege because at the age of 16 he, his father died and during partition they had to um, become refugees in India and he had to start supporting his family of illiterate mother and five brothers and sisters um, and go to night school to correspondence school to become a, eventually a professor in North America. But I mean, that's just an aside. But so I, I have seen in my experiences in India, a lot of women who suffer from great uh, lack of privilege, great oppression. Um, it's, it's typically, you know, intersectional with caste and class and economics. And, and so I, I tend to be very much, I think like Marley, very aware of the sort of how many elements are actually at play here alongside with gender. Um, and so I tend to approach it in a much more intersectional fashion. Um, and when I think about what I've done, it's been done from a place of privilege, like who gets to sit around at home and, and write articles and books, unless you're privileged enough not to be having to, you know, work nine to five for minimum wage or be making shoes in Indonesia for a dollar an hour. Um, so it really is, that's why it's not history making. Um, but I, I, I'm thankful for that opportunity, but I just so conscious of like in Afghanistan in the last couple of weeks, four women have been murdered because they went to work. That was their crime. Um, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> One piece that I'll add before we go on to the next question is really to encourage both our attendees as well as the women who are on the panel that we have this major expectation for what it means for history makers. And sometimes that grandiose definition keeps us from even recognizing as, as Coach Macy talked about those small wins. And we are, we have this pattern to shrink ourselves and not think so highly of the things that we have done and thinking of if it doesn't impact society as a whole, that means it doesn't have impact at all, which is definitely not the case because as many of these women have talked about in, in the impact in their families, impacts within their community on campus and them be history makers and wondering like they are her hashtag her story goals right and so i think that's an, an interesting point that i definitely want us to to reflect on and think about um the next question did you have any challenges that were connected to you being a woman and how did you overcome them i, I would love this is ann i would love to answer that question first because i've been in in um senior leadership a long time, most most of my career. And um, I can say the same thing that the, the men around the table, but uh, there she's going bossy. I have been called early in my career because I made you know the decision to be in leadership positions and was lucky enough to get them. Um, I could be seen as bossy, not, not you know, um, and I, and I don't think that the men had that same label. So I decided, you know, a long time ago that it would be better to be more a servant leader, to make sure that I was bringing people in, especially the young women that, that I hired to make sure they had a, a place at the table, to make sure that all ideas were honored and heard and make sure that, that um, everyone had an opportunity 
to have their voices and ideas heard. And I, and I think that, that um, I'm not saying that there aren't many wonderful men leaders who, who have those same, that same philosophy, but um, I, I think the tendency for women to be seen as bossy is still out there. That's a challenge. I have a, a fun story to tell you. <laughs> so early on in my career, um, first of all, I started out at GC as women's volleyball coach, women's basketball coach, and teaching classes at $12,000 a year. So, uh, <laughs> and that was considered full time. Uh, I guarantee you our men's coach was not doing the same thing. Uh, but later on, progressing a little ways, we hire a new coach and he was arrogant enough one day to announce what his salary was. And I thought, whoa, how is he making this amount of money when I'm doing all this work and making this amount of money? So I went to the athletic director at the time and questioned it. And he said, well, you're just going to have to go to the president. Well, People that know me knew that I worked a physical plant in the summers before I ever actually came full time. Um, and I went to the president at the time and his comment to me was that this gentleman's degree from Indiana University was better than my degree from ASU, Appalachian State, and that uh, I should be happy that I'm not on the tractor anymore. Um, so basically it was, I mean, I mean, if you heard that now, I could throw a lawsuit. I could, probably could have thrown a lawsuit then, but of course I probably would have ended my career at that point. So how did I handle it? You know, I let it go. I just kept working and honestly, uh, things have fallen into place along the way. Uh, not always the way you want it, but uh, I did try to fight for my rights, but that's, that's what happened at Greensboro College. So, if, if I could um, sort of piggyback on what Jean said, because this is also related to the, the wage gap, which is real. I mean, that <laughs> this is not something that we're making up. Um, you know, and I, I think a lot of women work in positions like teachers, you know, in public schools where, where you know, the surface wage gap is impossible because the salaries are dictated by state, you know, salary scales and that type of thing. But, you know, as an example of um, how that wage gap can can persist despite those equalizing forces, um, you know, it, when I was 21 or 21 years ago, I'm sorry, my husband and I made the decision that I would stay at home with our kids um, during their youngest years. And at the time I was working in a corporate real estate position, I was 28 years old. I had climbed. I just gave myself back two years, by the way. My math is off there somehow. Um, but anyway, so, uh, you know, I had climbed fairly quickly in, in, in for a young female person into a position of leadership in this company. And I was making a killer salary and I had a great bonus schedule. And my husband and I were living like the, the dink life, dual income, no children. And, you know, life was great. And so this question of like, who's going to like, do we want to put these kids in daycare, which is a choice many families make, or do, does one of us want to be home with them? We made the choice that one of us would be home with them. And so home I stayed and about, and, and I remember a male colleague saying to me, my superior at the time, who I was good friends with, but he said, I just don't think that this is going to be for you. I don't think you're going to be satisfied being a stay at home mom. And, and he goes, and he looked down and I had, you know, a really nice manicure at the time. And he said, and I'll be really interested to see if your hands are so carefully manicured after a year. And I thought that was such a strange comment to make at the time. And of course, after changing 750 million diapers, I kind of get it now. Ironically, he did not have children. Um, but it, I did stay home and I was very satisfied doing so. I had two daughters. So that, you know, it, that's, becomes part of my later story. Um, but after five years, I got a little restless and I wanted to go out and sort of satisfy curiosities and my own ambitions. And I found that, I, you know, I was a little bit disturbed to find that I had this mommy stamp all of a sudden. I had never had that before, you know, so here I come back into the workforce and I know I'm preaching to the choir here because most of us have been through that experience in one way or another. But, you know, I was branded the, the stay at home mommy who had this big gap in her resume. And People, you know, it wasn't that they didn't want me, but it was that I was not going to be walking back in at the same salary that I was making before. You know, I had devalued myself in the workforce because I had chosen this time to be at home with my kids. And um, 
I ended up having to sort of juggle things because none of the careers that I really felt passionate about were able to accommodate what I was now my responsibility at home. Um, so I ended up in education, which was not my passion at all. I, I've worked over the years to sort of shift it into something that can I can feel passionate about. And I do. I'm very, very dedicated to what I do now. But I can tell you that 21 years later, eight years in school, two degrees later, and how many decades? I'm making $40,000 less right now than I was when I was 28 years old. And, and I don't think that I'm the only one that tells that story. In other words, I think that there are many people out there that completely lost their traction in the workforce the minute that they decided to be parents. And I don't wow. regret <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to send the wrong message. Um, I do consider my daughter as part of my identity and, 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 and an important part of it. But um, yeah, I don't think that they can coexist all the time in a very successful, high paid corporate career. Wow, that thank you for sharing that. And would you you were about to add to that well, as well? I was well? going to say, and, and then the flip side to that, and and I've had this conversation with some of the other um, women on on the screen. Actually, is I've always worked my my all my daughter's lives. I've worked, um, and there was always the guilt of oh. should I be home? You know, I was missing things, especially in the summer. You know, I had to have um, you know there was always daycare and there were camps and. And, and I missed important things. Um, my daughters now, all, all three have, have multiple degrees and are all working moms. And they tell me now that, 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 they, admire, that, that they admire, they did not feel like I was letting them down. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at all, I mean, I wish that I could have, you know, I wish I had some of that time back that Michelle was able to give them. That was always something I felt like I was missing. So you can do it whatever is best for your family. And I'm saying this to the other young women who, who haven't gotten there yet, you know, do what's best for your family, but you're always going to feel the tug of, is this best for me? Is this best for my family? And I think as a woman, you always second guess that no matter which, no matter which way you go. Exactly. So I hope that, that, and you, that you understood my message that I'm, I don't cast judgment in either direction because right. if you're staying at home, you feel you know, that, that people are looking at you as taking the easy route road out. And if you go to work, then you never feel like you're giving your hold to either one. So it right. is a, a strange you know, not, space. You know, I didn't no judge them at all. I was just saying that, you know, we, yeah. we all have to have those sort of um, the tug both yeah. ways. You know. Well, in and my I would just story, oh, I'm sorry, ahead, just please one quick no, thing. No, well, in my story also, the president mentioned at that meeting that um, this gentleman, this other coach, um, because he had a family, he deserved to get paid more than me because I was single. So <laughs> anyways. I've heard that before too. You cannot win for lazy animals. Yeah, I was gonna add, um, even though I have a daughter who's five and very much a part of my identity, um, that I have seen differences in how people treat even women who have children versus women who choose not to have children or don't have children um, for whatever circumstance different. So I actually um, had a former supervisor who would let, you know, certain people, and I used to, you, you all know I have a problem with the word let, but he would, um, he had this power of time on and off and he would let people who, had children leave more, have more leniency, and me having children, having a child at that time, I said, you know, this still isn't right. So, you know, I took it upon myself in true DeAndre fashion to have a conversation about that, you know, even though people don't have children, especially women, it's like you're placing this burden that, okay, well, now they can have extra burden at, you know, extra work because they're not going home and doing anything where they still have the right to be compensated for extra time or, you know, enjoy their time and their mental health is still important. So, um, but I have seen that happen. So I just wanted to make space and stand in solidarity with women who don't have children um, to not have that pressure either or feel like they have to take on the extra load to accommodate other colleagues who do. Thank you. Our next question, how has being a double minority 
such as being a black woman impacted you? Marley, do you want to do you want to go first or? <laughs> I'll go after you. I'll collect my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Um, so I think that for me, and I speak for my experiences as a black woman, um, that I had to understand. It took me a while to understand and be able to articulate that my womanness is never separate from my blackness. So, and actually my primary identity is black because being black influences how I can navigate as a woman. So it changes the whole gender dynamic. And so there were times where I was comfortable in my womanness, but really struggling to be comfortable in my blackness um, because of certain environments I was in. Um, and so now being comfortable in, in both spaces and in, in that intersectionality is where I find the most power. Um, but the challenges I've had is the challenge of, you know, the, I am naturally um, someone who has strong opinions. I've always been ambitious. Um, and I used to wonder, oh, well, if I speak up, you know, will people look at me as, the angry black woman or will people look at me as this other certain type of stereotype or she's difficult or she's whatever. Um, but I had to just say, well, this is who I am as a human. So it's not even a question of, well, if I was a man, no one would say DeAndre is too much or DeAndre is too difficult. Um, but because I'm just DeAndre and not if I was a man or if I'm this or that, because I'm DeAndre and this is who I am, People are, I'm navigating professionally. Um, this is who I am. So people are going to have to deal. Um, and so that's where I really got confident in being in the intersectionality of those spaces. But it took a while. Um, and it's still hard when I'm in spaces or talking to people who see me, DeAndre the professional or DeAndre the friend who's loving and caring and who's a woman, but they don't want to recognize that my blackness impacts all of that. And so as someone who cares about me as a human, I need you to care about my blackness and my womanness. Thank you, Marley. Um, so for me, I, I've had a bit of a, an issue with you know my identity because I am biracial, and um, although you know, physically a lot of people will look at me and just automatically, automatically assume ethnicity. Um, but m my father's from the Caribbean. So my culture has been that of someone who's Afro-Caribbean. Um, so I have had uh, a different experience um, and a different upbringing. So that's something that I struggled with um, and I still do struggle with. Um, I will say professionally, um, I. It, it may be self-inflicted, but I feel like, um, you know, as a young coach, there's always this, um, I feel a, a pressure to, uh, to always watch how I, how I project myself. Um, and similar to what DeAndre was saying about um, maybe, especially in, in college coaching and coaching in general, um, there are times where you, you, you do be, you're perceived as intense. Um, and because of that stigma of, um, of that black women are associated with, um, I don't wanna ever come across necessarily as aggressive, even though that's something that people may be projecting onto me, not necessarily that I'm projecting to them. Um, so uh, it, I'm working on what DeAndre is saying about standing you know, true to myself and standing proud um, of who I am and not really uh, caring what people uh, perceive me as if the intent is, you know, not necessarily anything different than a, a male or another coach um, would be perceived as. Um, so I guess uh, for me, um, uh, my, the things that have impacted me have been when I I was uh, a college student and you know always being that token either black girl 
um, or someone to be the educator for um, for Black people or that spokesperson. Um, so it's it's a very fine line for me to try to be the educator while um, if something had happened while still grieving and mourning on my own. Um, so going into now my professional career, um, especially with uh, the, the current climate and situations that, have, that happened last summer, um, it was definitely difficult as a prof to maintain my sense of professionalism um, while still being somewhat, you know, strong on my own. Um, so I, I can only hope that uh, for my, my players that I'm setting a good example, that, you know, I'm somewhat trying to educate them um, with the, with the I, I guess, with the caveat being, you know, I shouldn't be the one educating, you know, everyone, you know, can, how can I encourage um, the people around me to educate themselves. Um, so that's that's something definitely as a professional that I'm still struggling with um, and still trying to navigate on my own. But. Thank you both. Are there other women on the panel who identify as having a double minority, not necessarily specifically just being a black woman? Did you have anything I else do. you'd like to add? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a very different experience because um, I grew up in Canada, in French Canada, in Quebec, as an English minority with a blonde mother and a brown father <laughs> um, when there was not a huge immigrant population in Canada. And I spent my high school years um, trying to pretend that I was a, a white American <laughs> to sort of fit in in my all girl school. And then, and then as soon as I found myself embracing the Indian side of my um, identity, I moved to the States, went to film school, and lo and behold, no long, nobody any longer saw me as being biracial uh, because I didn't look the part enough. Um, so I have the weird, the, the weird alternate experience of un being unable in some sense to claim my biraciality because I don't look enough the part. Um, so it gets into this whole weird issue of not just ethnicity, but colorism and uh, all sorts of weird things. Um, so it's a very different space and it's not a space I would say at all compares to some of the stories you've told, but it is an interesting, complicated space, I think. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Are there women who have influenced you? And if so, please share. I can take this one, I think. Um, I always go to the, you know, the top scholars in my field and, and I find that I'm, you know, profoundly impacted by some other, like Lisa Del Pitt and Ava Hoffman, um, Guadalupe Valdez, I mean, I could go on and on and, and I'm in awe of the work that they do, but I've also found that that there isn't any one female that's contributing to my field that I align with 100%, but I don't disagree with anyone 100% either. Like, I, you know, and I think that it's that way with, with most things in life. It's not as black and white as we want it to be. Um, but an example that comes to my mind is, um, oh God, her last name, Hoschild. Um, and she wrote the second shift. And if you're familiar with it, it's, you know, about, it's a feminist work that's about, you know, the women who are in the workforce and they come home and it's still their responsibility to make sure the kids have what they need for daycare the next day. And, you know, that the, that the grocery shopping's been done and birthdays were remembered. And I mean, I can exhaust myself going down the list of things that, you know, whether you have a helpful partner or not tend to fall in the mental work of a female and, and how exhausting that mental work can be. And, and I was like, wow, this really, you know, this really impacts me. I, you know, I see this in my own life because at the time I was in graduate school and working full time and my husband was, you know, working full time and we had kids. Um, you know, so I was like, I, you know, I, I, now I understand why I'm so tired. And then her next work, and I don't remember the name of it, but her next work was deeply critical of families that outsource is what she called it. But, you know, so now she's criticized women for I mean, she's, she's in a sense, 
um, recognized women for the work that they do outside of their jobs, but then turns around in her next work and criticizes them for utilizing the financial resources that that brings into the family to hire personnel, um, to to get a landscaper, to um, have some excuse me, somebody else do their taxes, you know, whatever it might be, and talks about the dangers that that poses to the family. And I just went, well, there she's, <laughs> she's off my list now. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're all just trying to stay afloat and survive. And you use the resources that you have. And that is part of being a person, but definitely part of being a woman, I think. And so, um, yeah, I usually when I fall in love with a scholar of some kind, I end up, um, you know, falling back out of love for various reasons, but there are wonderful women in my field doing awesome work. And then I, I just have to say my mom, you know, that's like, she's the most influential person in my life. And she was with my daughters and I, and we went and marched in Washington when Hillary Clinton lost. And, um, you know, it was three generations of nasty women. And, and she's just always been um, a role model and in, in how nothing can slow you down. Her story's a long one, but I hope that I am continuing and, and I'll go ahead and answer the next question. I'm continuing that legacy because that to me is the most important thing. Um, so yeah. I'd, I'd like to answer that. Yes. Um, probably my, aside from my mother and grandmother, my dad, because from, from early on, I, I'll always, as far as I can remember, he's told me I could do anything. I could be anything, anything that I, that I wanted. And, and I don't know that all of my friends' dads were that supportive and, you know, wanted them to, to, to really excel. But, um, you know, on a larger scale, Gloria Steinem, um, feminist and, and author, Hillary Clinton, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I'm talking about before she was um, even on the Supreme Court, but when she was, was yes, <laughs> her, her, oh, you know, um, when she was fighting for civil rights and, and, uh, and women's rights. Um, as an attorney, and and Alice Paul and all the early suffragists. Um, I've been a member of of National Organization for Women since the late '70s. You know, and I was when I was in college. Actually, um, we still have a lot of work to do for women's rights, um, equality of um, you know salaries, of pay, um, voting rights. I'm very concerned about voting rights, but. Um, so yeah, on a, on a big scale, those women have, have really influenced me. Um, for me, I would say, you know, starting my earliest influencers, of course, was my mom. She was um, a working mom. She was in the army for 21 years. Um, so she went to Desert Storm. She went to the war in Iraq. Um, so I very much looked up to her. I just thought she was so strong even though she's just like a really nice and sweet person, um, she put that uniform on and I was like, oh my gosh, but I can't do that, but I'm so happy for her. Um, so I just always looked up to her and then my grandmother um, as well. And when I got to college, you know, starting to read Bell Hooks and Dora Neale Hurston and um, a lot of the womanist theories out there really helped um, shape my identity and come into who I was. Um, and so those people as well. And then when there was a comment earlier in my, well, in college, because I, you know, we'd always talk about what we wanted to do and aspirations. And someone told me, they were like, oh, well, you know, you're never going to get married if you want to do all of that in your career. Like an actual adult on my college campus told me that. Um, and so I, and it just so happened to be the election of Barack Obama was my first election I could vote in. And so I was like, seeing Michelle Obama come out was like, oh my gosh, like, I want to find that person and laugh in Michelle Obama's, in Michelle Obama, like, because, like, she was doing all of these things. And she was just this, like, captivating Black woman. Um, and so for me, that was someone who I was like, okay, like, this is on a major stage where, like this is possible. And if being married is a goal, then it can still happen. But if it's not, it doesn't have to be the sum of my life isn't about if I find a partner or not. Um, and so that was just, those were some defining moments for me um, as a woman and coming into my own as a woman, as a black woman um, that really helped me. Well, anybody that knows me knows it's my mom, <laughs> but um, 
you know, and I could go on, everybody knows how their mothers and fathers influenced them. But also um, a lady named Kathy Deborah, who is the executive director of the American Volleyball Coaches Association. She, uh, I served on the board uh, for 11 years and she actually has written books and done many talks about uh, the difference between coaching men and women. And um, it, it actually had a major influence on my coaching, but also in my teaching. Uh, uh, of course, I teach a coaching class and things like that. So uh, I, I think she has had a major influence on me. Thank you. Um, in doing my research, I am starting to quote some of my qualitative research as foremothers because often we hear folks talk about forefathers, but the impact of foremothers is definitely one that most people will, will talk about. Um, and even if they didn't necessarily have the most positive or healthy relationship, even those negative relationships and the desire to have a positive relationship has a great impact on the women that we are and the women that we, we choose to be in, 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 as ourselves and in relation to others. So our last like formal question, what do you want your legacy to be? Coach Macy, if you would start out, we haven't heard from you in a, in a bit. I'd be glad to. I'm so sorry. I, I had a little pause uh, with my Zoom. So let me know if, the, if we have any problems while I'm answering. But um, thanks so much. I, I think for me, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. You know, I worked at a college and every day I would come into the main door and you would come into a Hall of Fame area. And if you'd go to the right, you'd go up the stairs, you'd go to the women's basketball office office. There's a practice facility. Same offices, okay. same locker okay. room, same practice facility. Did I pause? Yeah, yeah just for a <laughs> bit. Um, for a moment, I had to make sure it wasn't on my side, but I'm like, oh, other people are moving. I'm so okay. sorry. Uh, <laughs> we were hearing you talk about, oh, no, 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 no. Walking past the Hall of Fame and the basketball, uh, to the basketball office and practice facility. So it's the women's basketball facility where you have a practice gym and offices and a locker room. And you go to the left and you walk up the stairs and it's identical. Same office, same locker room, same practice facility. The difference is every single day when I walk, into the front door through the Hall of Fame area, I was only allowed to go to the right side, to the women's basketball coaching side. When one of my colleagues, I had several male assistant coaches on my staff. The, the difference is when they walked through those same doors, they had opportunity to. When you go to the left, left You get paid three times the amount. If I had that same opportunity, women, I think that that's the area and the route that we as female leaders need to go. So I would encourage uh, anyone on the call to work competency because I think we have to be the most competent person in the room in our craft to be able to, at some point, you know, my hope moving forward is when I walk. Heather, give us just a second. Um, um, Cause now you just went on mute. Um, I'm gonna ask that you take your video off and maybe that would help because you're seeing some really great stuff and I, don't want us to miss it. So you were talking about three times as much and if you had that opportunity. Okay, did that help? Yes, it does. Okay, I'll do the best I can. I'm so sorry about the internet situation. Um, 
so I would encourage all female leaders when they have an opportunity to promote or an opportunity to hire um, other females. And we've lost Ability. you again. Okay. I apologize. Oh, I'm no. sorry about that. I, mean, I wish that this wasn't. I case. know. It, but again, I think we pretty much got the contents of what you were saying of recognizing that even as women, when we have the opportunity to uplift other women um, and knowing the fact that it, it, and this is just obviously my interpretation of what you were trying to say. It's, it's, it's harder to, to keep us down if it's, if we've got all these other women pushing us up. Um, and having, making ways and having opportunities for us. Hear, um, is there anyone else in the, say that again? Okay. Um, is there anyone else from our panel who'd like to talk on what you want your legacy to be? I've okay, go ahead, Ann. I've always wanted my legacy to be um, that I I helped others um, access education that maybe wouldn't have had the same opportunities. I mean, that's always been my my biggest goal. But also, um, I hope that I have helped open some doors for other women in in senior leadership and and um, in the development world, and and so that is my two legacies, I hope. Okay, DeAndre, you had your hand up. Oh, um, I didn't want to dominate the answer, so I was waiting on others. But I would say that I'm a um, change maker at my core. Um, and so I love solving problems and thinking about who is left out and advocating for those who don't have the voice to advocate for themselves. So. I want my legacy to be a legacy of making positive change for those who don't have the agency or the privilege um, to advocate for themselves. And then to, again, increase representation for all young women. I think it's important for Black women um, or for younger Black girls, for girls of color, um, and for white girls um, to see just different people being successful because past the race, is a story that everybody could look up to. And so um, I think the more representation that's there breaks down the stereotypes of what you learn just growing up that you can or cannot do. So I hope that those pieces are a part of my legacy. Michelle, did you? I was just gonna briefly say, I said earlier that, you know, I, I view my daughters as, as my legacy and, and most of what I do in, in this life is to make sure that they have opportunities and, you know, feel empowered to do what they want to do. And, and it's been thrilling to see them reach young adulthood and, and see that begin to happen. And so I'm super excited about that. But the story that I told earlier about making less money now that I did when I was 28 years old, you know, part of that question was, how have you overcome the obstacles that have been placed in front of you as a woman? And I have to say, honestly, um, you know, if you look at the surface level, I haven't, you know, in other words, I'm still working for less money and I'm still, but what I'm hoping that I've done is been able to take that story and, and show my daughters and their friends and, and the young women that are in my life, in my life, um, you know, that, that I chose a path that was not, that was based on my own inner worth and not the dollar amount that's assigned to my life's work by a paycheck, you know, and, and what I earn. Um, and hopefully that they'll be able to see that. I mean, I hope they make a bunch of money so that they can be comfortable, but but I hope that they'll also choose a path that's right, um, you know, based on on their heart and, and the work that they assign themselves and not what our society assigns to their work. Thank you. I do want to call attention to the chat um, from Coach Macy who talked about there can absolutely be two women in the same room and let's help one another do it. Um, I think it's really interesting um, that when there are five men, no one makes a bat's eye, but the minute there's a second woman, it's like, oh, wait, we, we met our quota. Or sometimes because of the environmental um, situations, it can cause friction between those women because now society has put them in a situation where they're competing to be the one. 
Um, and that's absolutely not something that um, we definitely um, want to, to put forward. For the sake of time, um, before I ask um, our, our last question, are there any questions from our audience or from our participants um, who wanted one of the panelists to talk more about something that they shared or had any particular questions for them? Feel free to go ahead and state it as opposed to adding it in the chat. I'm not sure how okay, this is. Okay, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Anna Marie. Um, I've just been thinking there's there's a, a different backgrounds for each of the panelists, but as you've all stated, women just by most, uh, by, by nature, um, are, are caregivers at, at heart. Um, that's not always the roles that we're, we're in, but um, we're, it's perceived that we will be the ones that do that. So then for the panelists in your careers, have there been, and there've been a couple of mentions of this, um, men, whether it's in your own house or in, in work or other where, places where you really had to you had to uh, step back from your role, from your career or from your, um, your plans and not by choice necessarily, like, like for having children like Dr. Plaisance and having, having this conscious decision, but you just had to quietly step back and put things on hold a little bit but then knowing yourself that you would get back to it or that it would work out well, maybe just in a different way. I have a loosely related example um, that I think other women have probably experienced because coming back into the workforce, you know, coming out of, of my doctoral program, it, when you go on the market, you know, hopefully you're doing a national search where you can choose, you know, the right program, the right school. Not that I don't love being at Greensboro College, please don't misunderstand me, but my husband's work geographically bound us to the, the Charlotte area. And because of the differentials in our income, we didn't have the choice for him to pick up and move with us. That just wasn't an option. We would have had to, um, you know, sacrifice too much financially. So, I, and I think a lot of people are in that same boat where because they make less money, decisions are made um, about careers and, and the husband's is prioritized or the man's is prioritized. Not always the case. This is stereotype. This is the truth in my house. I, if, if you all don't mind, I actually have a different <laughs> um, story even to add to that. I think even as so many of the women on the panel have talked about having to be all the things for everybody, um, I had a health scare that caused me to have to step back both from work and from my responsibilities at home. And it was a huge, I don't want to even say blow to my ego, but it was earth shattering for my identity because I, first of all, didn't recognize who I was outside of work. I didn't, it, it caused me literal pain to know that I could not take care of my children. There were so many pieces that are, that are added on to that. And I think on top of all the pressure that we have from society to do all of those things, we put those pressures on ourselves as well. And it can be difficult to let go of them and to step back and say, hey, I need help. Um, and so I do think there is this, you know, superwoman complex um, that develops that you have to be able to, to forgive yourself or give yourself enough grace to recognize that you are, are still human. Is there anyone else who'll add to that, to Anna Marie's question? Sasha, I just wanted to um, share that I can definitely identify that as having an invisible illness. Um, you know, I've always been a pretty, you know, I've said over and over, I've been very ambitious, a high performer. Um, and so when I had a health scare, well, early on, um, you know, I had the same piece, but mine was more about but when I go back, I'm on this track to get a promotion. And when I go back, who's going to have taken my spot? Because in my mind, the culture 
It was like, well, there's only one woman who can be, you know, get this promotion. So me was more like, well, who's going to take my spot in all of these pieces? And so I had to let that go. Um, and also let go of the perfectionist identity. I realized that I was being a perfectionist at work because I knew that if I got sick, if I was on top of everything and always this like perfect piece, which doesn't exist, then hopefully people will remember what I did while I was out. And I've had to let that go to say, you know, no one's perfect. And while you're a perfectionist, that's going to do more detriment. That stress does more detriment than letting, you know, being who you are, being your best every day and learning from every experience, the good and the bad. And so that's what I've had to um, grow into. But a good mentor of mine, because I was calling her and I was going all down the rabbit hole and um, during this time, and she said, DeAndre, super women die young because they stress themselves out. They don't take, take care of themselves. They're trying to do everything. She's like, do not run yourself ragged. Do not be the superwoman that doesn't let everybody help, anyone help you, that is always on this quest per, for perfection, that never takes a break. She's like, because you are going to burn yourself out at work and personally. Um, and so that has always stuck with me because, and I know she needed to say it to me like that. It may sound harsh on here, but I, I have to respond well to, I respond well to things like that. Um, so she needed to say that to me so I could really hear her. Um, and so I always remember that to prioritize my wellness um, in those moments because there's so many things competing within our identity. Thank you. Well, is there anything else that anyone who's on the call would like to add, not just our panelists? be it question or comment. I would like to thank you again for, for putting this together, for hosting this. And I, I, you know, we always hope that more students will participate or, you know, will see it. And I, I hope that they do because, um, you know, uh, they have all of this to look forward to <laughs> and maybe they can learn and do better than, you know, than we did along the way. So thank you again. Thank you. Well, again, I just want to thank all of our panelists, everyone who, who joined us today and everyone who will watch this at a later date for this. Oh, awesome. I'm, okay, so all these chats are coming in. Um, I wanna be respectful of this um, great opportunity um, and honor. Michelle talks about being very honored to sit among these talented women. Thank you so much for your energy and your strength. Tika Green talks about how, um, Okay, here we go. Um, and um, thank you so much and how much she greatly enjoyed this. Um, and then we have quite a few other thank yous to me and to the panel. So I just want to say, um, oh, okay, Jordan talking about thank you, a welcome opportunity to hear from some of the amazing women on our campus. And I think that's, if if for nothing else, that's the, the piece that I personally wanted to hit home in that is that so often we look so far away from ourselves for all of these women that we look up to. And it's natural for us to think about our foremothers or the scholars in our field, but sometimes the person that you need and the encouragement and the story that will help you go is right next door. Um, and so I want Want to thank all of you all um, for and thank you Tom um, for sharing your your um, uh, sharing for everyone sharing their strength. One of the things that I'll end with that I was definitely in love with during the interview process is recognizing that even for the athletic logo of the Pride, it's not just the lion but also the lioness. Um, they, everything that you know about lions and understanding the culture that even though the lion is the king of the jungle, he doesn't get much done, including not even eating without the women of the pride. So thank you so much for the women of the pride who are here um, and sharing their experiences with us. And I look forward to you all um, tuning into our very next event. Um, the Sankofa Center is hosting a Patio Tuesday, and that will be happening next week from 7 to nine on the student center patio and it is a neon karaoke edition so it'll be great and fun and i hope to see you all there thank you very much
Thank you so much, Kaja.